So get excited about enrichment for shelter dogs. Um, how many people are like frontline animal care staff? Okay, and how many people are like support staff or office staff or administrators? All right, and how many people are volunteers? Okay, cool. All right, so one of the things about creating a successful enrichment program is that you need cooperation from all parts of the shelter. So it's really hard to start one from the bottom up when you don't have any support from your, the people who make your budgets, basically, who tell you how much money you can spend and tell you how much time you can spend. And it's really hard to make it from the top down to where you're going back to your shelter and you say to your animal care staff, you are going to do this now. And they say, we don't have any time in the day to do that. So it's really about collaborating between management and frontline staff in order to figure out what is going to be feasible for your shelter. So I want to give you some examples of things that, uh, basically I'm going to give you an overview of our dog enrichment program. So Lollipop Farm, is a mid-sized open admission shelter. We take between 10,000 to 12,000 animals in a year. Um, and we have, what did we decide? Last talk, sorry, there's a couple of lollipop people again. How many animal care staff we have? 30, between 30 and 50? And about 90 um, staff overall. All right. And they asked me to hold questions till the end, and we'll get to questions then. All right, enrichment in the shelter. So this is a review from last time, but companion animals in a shelter are not in their natural environment. What's the natural environment of a companion animal? A home, right. Uh, so we need to create, it's almost like they're in captivity. We need to create a complex stimulating environment so that they can perform species typical behaviors, things that they would do normally in their natural environment, and so that we can give them a lot of choices and some control over how they spend their days. And in my mind, enrichment isn't optional. You need to do some kind of enrichment, but you need to find strategies that are going to work for your animal care staff. So at Lollipop Farm, we do have a behavior department, um, but we are tasked with doing behavior modification and working with some of the harder to adopt out animals. Um, we do training classes. We do private training consultations. So we have a lot of other things on our plate. Most of the enrichment is done by the frontline staff. So we are helping them come up with ideas. We're supporting them when they need it. We are helping them do some of the more labor intensive things. But for the most part, all the things I'm going to tell you about are done by our, the people who take care of our dogs. So one of the guiding principles when I'm making an enrichment plan, just like with the cats, I try to consider the natural history of the species or what their typical environment would be and how they would spend their time. So this is my dog, Lima. Uh, and this is another behavior department staff dog. Uh, so Lima spends a lot of her time, if, she, if it were up to her, she'd basically be sleeping or sniffing things. Those would be her two favorite activities. Uh, she's really into birds and smelling scents outside. Um, and if you think about the typical dog, they're going to spend a lot of time sleeping, but they get to decide where they're sleeping. So she's, you know, taking over half the bed here, but you might have your dog up on the couch. They might be on a bed. They have choices about where they're going to spend their time and where they're going to rest. Uh, in a typical home, there's lots of food smells. There's lots of you know, taste enrichment. Maybe you give them a little nibble of your sandwich. There's playtime. They get a lot of options about how to spend their day. And they get a lot of stimulation in a typical day. And some of them have dog friends. Some of them don't, and that's OK, too. But you basically want to think about the species that you're building an enrichment plant for, and what is the typical day for that species. And if possible, how can we build that in the shelter? The other guiding principle that you always want to keep in mind with enrichment is that we want to allow for choices and control. And so since about half of you are new, I'm going to go ahead and go into these studies again. So control has actually been found to be a primary reinforcer. So primary reinforcers are things that you don't have to teach animals or people to like. So there are things that you need to live, like food, like water, are primary reinforcers. Control has actually been shown to also be a primary reinforcer. So behavior can change just by allowing for control of the situation. So they did a, set, a series of studies in the 60s and 70s on babies and mobiles. And there were two sets of babies. One, the mobiles were tethered to the motion of the baby's head. So if they moved their heads, the mobiles moved. The other set of babies, 
it was untethered to the motion of the babies. They moved the same amount as the first group, um, but it didn't matter what the baby did, the mobile just moved. They actually found that the babies who could control the motion laughed more, they moved their heads more, they smiled more. So just by being able to control it, and they had the same level of exposure to the movement of the mobile, the babies changed their behavior, and they seemed to be having a better time. Uh, there was another study in the 60s that the original intention of the study was to look at this nocturnal deer mouse and see what is their ideal level of light. So they trained the mice to use dimmer switches. And what actually happened in their experiment, they were like, okay, we're gonna put the mice in the room. There's a dimmer switch on either side of the room. They're gonna set the light level that they prefer and they're gonna keep it like that. We're gonna be able to tell like, oh, that's their preference for the light level. What actually happened was that the mice spent all their time running back and forth between the light switches to switch them on and off. And so their behavior changed and they actually overcame an aversion to bright light. So just by being able to control it, they were able to not scurry away when a bright light happened. So just by having some control um, and some choice in the matter, they were, their behavior changed for the better. So we always wanna keep that in mind when we are thinking about an enrichment plan for an animal. So again, this is review from last time, but getting started, uh, what I recommend that you do is meet with all the staff involved uh, and give them options. So you've done your research, you've thought about the natural history, you've thought about where can we create choice and control. And it's hard to read, uh, and you'll get these slides later, but this is an example from the cows. So we have, you know, we're talking today about dogs and cats, we have so many species of animals at lollipop farms. We've got farm animals, we have reptiles, we have birds, we have small animals. Um, we are currently revamping our enrichment program for our farm animals. So my first step was to go through and think about the natural history of each animal, think about where we can increase choice and control, and then do research into what are other people doing with their cows that make their cows happier. So then I have a list of options. I meet with the farm staff who are involved in the care of the cows, and I give them multiple options and I let them choose. So remember, you know, creating choice is good and it's good for your staff too. Give them some choices, let them choose what they wanna do. And then I have them evaluate each activity at least three times. So we're gonna try each enrichment strategy. Sorry, is the microphone working? Is that a lot of feedback? Good? Okay. Uh, you're gonna evaluate each three times, make observations about how much the animals are interacting with that enrichment strategy or how much they're engaging, and then decide to continue it or not. Maybe we move on. Maybe the cows ignore the football that you place in the pasture, but they really like the hanging empty gallon plastic containers. You know, you wanna just be really clear eyed and make really good observations about is this intervention working for this group of animals or is it working for this individual animal? Because if you don't see a behavior change for the better, you might decide to choose a different strategy and that's probably the way to go if you're not seeing a change. So the way that we keep records for uh, our dog enrichment program right now is we have one big whiteboard in a central location, so it's in the kitchen area and the kennel staff members actually, this is two of the dog care kennel staff uh, staff members, and they were having a super, super fun time creating this enrichment board, and they did it all on their own because they wanted to help each other keep track. So if you look, it has the days of the week and then the different categories of enrichment that we're gonna do. And then every day, click for calm, which we'll talk about in a minute. How many people were at Kelly Bowen's talk earlier? Okay, so some of this will be a little bit of review in the beginning for you guys. So we have uh, an overall whiteboard that keeps track of what strategies we're doing each day and what change we're gonna make each day. And then in the suite of kennels or in each area, there's um, six kennels. And then we have another little whiteboard that shows, so these are dogs who are not up for adoption um, and they're getting their walks through uh, with the kennel staff members. And then, you know, Wednesday, and again, this picture is from yesterday. So this Wednesday was pool day because it was nice and hot, although a couple of the dogs had surgery. And their little code for a heart is that the dog really liked eating out of a bag that day. Um, and then Friday, these guys got that different, those different types of toys. So uh, I would rather keep records like this just so everyone's on the same page and everyone 
is doing it, and we can glance in and check, then make everyone fill out a page in a binder. So we did initially try having, OK, each kennel is going to have a sheet of paper, and we're going to fill, you know, as you do an enrichment with that animal, you're going to fill out this piece of paper and keep track that way, and then we're going to keep them all in a binder. And it was way too cumbersome. People didn't do it. Uh, it didn't really make sense because we weren't really using the data that we gathered from these paper sheets anyway. So this makes a lot more sense for us. And it helps them do it a little bit faster, yet still keep track of it so that they get to help more animals uh, in a day. So I know some other shelters keep track of things differently. So I know a lot of people do the binder. And if that works for you, great. When I was at uh, the Tompkins County SPCA, we had more of a binder situation, and that works because we were a lot smaller shelter. Shemung has these cool um, boards that they make with little Velcro things where you have all these like options for what the dog might like, and then you can stick it up on the Velcro board and say what play group are they in, and that's pretty cool too. All right. Uh, so we're going to go pretty quickly through environmental enrichment because uh, Kelly talked a lot about this in her stress reduction talk. But when we are looking at housing, we want to make sure that everybody has a comfortable resting area. Blankets or beds, half crates, elevated platforms. Um, as Kelly was saying, like even a whole crate. Sometimes you get into trouble with the whole crate if you have a really, really fearful dog who then won't come out of the small crate, then you obviously need different intervention. Um, but everybody has to have some kind of comfy place to rest. If possible, if we have someone who's just really stressed out in their cage, then we look at office fosters. So this is a little sad, really sad Shih Tzu in my office one day. Uh, and Or taking the dog out to be an adoption area greeter and sitting at the adoption desk with the counselors. Uh, just giving them some more out of, time, out of their kennel time to uh, interact with humans and to have an option besides spending time in the kennel. Again, this is a review from Kelly. We do a lot of blocking visual access. So if we have a dog who has really poor kennel presentation, say when other dogs walk by, they're barking, growling, lunging, then we are going to put up a sheet so that they are going to have a little bit less stimulation when another dog walks by. And we have signs up everywhere. So this is a sign on the window of a door. You see this rocky staring. Uh, to keep all the doors shut. So as we're walking through, we make sure all the doors are shut. Uh, the way our shelter is, there are, are sort of pods of six kennels. So we keep the doors shut just to reduce the sound traveling between pod to pod. Co-housing can get a little bit tricky. You have to make really good matches. It can be really good for some dogs to stay with the dog that they came in with. But it can also be really irritating to some dogs because remember, you're going from living with this dog in a house where you have all kinds of control and all kinds of options for how far you're going to get away from that dog. And now you're living in a kennel 24 hours and you are next to each other all of the time. I have seen some dogs who come in together not want to live in a kennel together. So you need to be a little bit vigilant about that making sure that they're not having conflicts, that they're sharing food appropriately, or even just feeding them separately to avoid conflict, because there's a lot more exposure to each other than what they would see in a normal home. If you are going to make a co-housing match between two dogs that didn't come in together, you do have to be really careful. Obviously, you would never mix sizes, so you're going to try to match sizes and match energy levels and play styles. So, Ideally, the co co-housing pair would be two dogs of the same size that both have very calm but friendly temperaments with other dogs, so that you're not, you don't have two giant dogs who are just wrestling the entire time and riling everyone else up. Um, and so we are really, really careful about co-housing dogs that didn't come in together, and we don't do it that often. All right, I wanted to show a little video um, from a shelter in Colorado that had some really cool shaped kennels. So this is a shelter in Golden, Colorado. And their kennels I really liked because it had so many options for the dogs. So their kennels are kind of, you'll see they're kind of L-shaped. So the dog can go back behind the little short leg of the L if they want to have a little bit less exposure to people. 
And in this same shelter, they had kennels with changeable doors. So you could have a glass door or like a plastic door or a mesh, metal mesh door. Or you could be in a big room with a glass door or a metal mesh door. Or an even bigger room. There was one room, Melissa was with me, who's giant. Like one little dog sitting on one of the plastic couches. I was like, wow, you really won the lottery here. Hello, cute animals. So look at, see, isn't that awesome how their kennel goes back like that? It's like they have a little hiding place like for a cat. So if they want less exposure, they can get it. So if you're building new kennels, consider that. If you have existing kennels, consider the sheet. All right, we play classical music in all of our dog areas. Uh, in all the videos that you're going to see coming up, you'll be able to hear a little bit of classical music playing. We have an all-classical NPR station in Rochester, WXXI. It's great because we have classical music and then calm human voices. It's sort of ideal for a kennel situation. Uh, Kelly mentioned this also, but we, we use through a dog's ear sometimes as well. It's supposed to be psychoacoustically tuned to make them more calm. Uh, I don't know, it's a toss-up, I would say, that versus the classical NPR. But if you have a place where you don't get good reception or you don't have an all-classical NPR, that's a great one, you know, to pick. Maybe don't pick like super crazy, I don't know, like Wagner, maybe tone it down a little bit. A little uh, nicer classical music, not so exciting. But Through a Dog's Ear is great, and I think they do have a shelter donation program. And then just remember to turn everything off at night. So you don't want to just keep the music playing all night. And we have a very strict classical music only rule at Lollipop. And that cha that's changed a lot since I started. People were listening to pop. Some people were listening to country. And it's, the music is there for the animals. It's not there for the staff. And so it's very important to get everybody on the same page with the music. All right. I did want to talk for cl uh, about Click for Calm. So we have a pretty active Click for Calm, or uh, I think Kelly called it Click for Quiet. That's what she called it. And, so we have a very active program in our shelter. We have a lot of student Abosi student groups that come through. So they come in and help out three days a week. And we have um, student interns who come in and do this as well. It's great for everybody. Volunteers we train to do it. Staff we train to do it. It's really easy. You're just working on reinforcing calm behavior. You go to a kennel. If the dog barks, you move to the next kennel. If they don't bark, you click and treat. The click tells them why it tells them what behavior they were doing is producing the treat. How many people uh, have clicker trained an animal? Okay, how many people have not heard of clicker training? Oh, that's good. Yay! Everyone has at least heard of clicker training. That's good. Uh, this is at the very least exposing them to the clicker, so they're getting a little bit of experience with the clicker. But it it also causes them to think like, oh. What was I doing? What, what just happened here? And if you were doing this with just tossing treats, you would probably do OK. But you're not going to do as good as if you're using a click. Because say you look at a dog, they're not barking. So you go to toss a treat. And as soon as you release the treat, they start to bark. They're going to think, oh, I got that for barking. That's great. So the clicker really helps with timing. It teaches them that whatever they were doing when they heard the click, that's what they're getting the treat for. So some basic clicker training rules. You always feed after you click. You click and reinforce behaviors. You want to tap more frequently. And it's very mentally stimulating. So it's really great for tiring out your active dogs. It's great for giving confidence to your shy dogs. Training through positive reinforcement is, is great for any shelter animal. And I'll talk a little bit more about clicker training in just a second. But specifically, click for calm looks like this. So you might hear some of the dogs will sit. So she's waiting for them to sit. So Frostbite was sleeping, or he wasn't looking at her, but he wasn't barking. So she went ahead and clicked and gave a treat anyway.
because then he still has the option to eat it later. And there she lures that dog onto the ground with the treat so that she's not reinforcing jumping on the kennel. Yeah, isn't it quiet? I don't know. I know it actually, so there's a second video and I was like, okay, we gotta go somewhere else like someone will bark and then no one barked in the second video either. So I was just like, again, this was like yesterday afternoon. I was like, it's what it's gonna be. Okay, no one's barking, it's great. No, I mean, when, yeah, when you're doing click for calm a lot, they, they're usually very quiet. I mean, you're gonna see some feeding enrichment videos later. It still can be very loud at mealtime, especially if you're not sort of linking the two things together, which we're not doing super effectively yet. I'll talk about that. <laughs> deaf dog. Oh yeah, so she didn't click that dog because that dog was deaf. So if we had a light, we could use a pen light as a marker for that dog. So, you know, you, may, you do the best you can with a bunch of puppies. <laughs> and is there anyone here who considers themselves like a serious clicker trainer? Like you clicker train a lot and you're like really into it. Okay, so as a fellow serious clicker trainer, you know, like my one critique of that would be like, they're all just like looking at the bag, right? You know, like they're like, the bag is right there. Uh, but through repetition, and sometimes she doesn't have the bag, sometimes she does, or sometimes she has a treat bag, sometimes she doesn't, they're going to start to generalize that a person is in front of my kennel. Like, sometimes good things happen if I don't bark. So they start to choose that behavior more often. So again, that, we took those videos like an hour after second mealtime. So you're going to see some videos coming up that's during mealtime and to get the videos we were feeding out of order, which was making some dogs very upset. So you will get to hear some barking in just a minute. But very quiet kennels when you practice click for calm. The more people that you can get to practice this, the better. And it's so easy. It takes like 10 minutes, you know, however big your kennel is, you just go around a couple of times, click and reinforce as you're walking around. You can do it with dogs that have just come in. You can do it with dogs that have been here for a while. They start to catch on. And, and the more people you can get to do it, the more effective it's going to be. And this is one place that you can really engage the non-animal care staff because they don't have to handle the animals. So if you're worried about them handling the animals and potentially getting into an unsafe situation, they just have to walk around. And you can even teach them to toss the treats in. So you don't even have to hand the treats. They can toss the treats. And this is a way to get them to start helping out uh, with the animal care. All right, feeding enrichment. Uh, we have a lot of fun things we do for feeding enrichment at the shelter. Uh, and given the choice, many animals would rather work for their food. So you can do this experiment with your own animals. So give your cat or your dog a puzzle toy with food in it and then just a little bit of food in their bowl. And some animals will go play with the puzzle toy first before going to eat the food that's just for free. Uh, one of my cats will choose a puzzle toy, the other one will choose the free food. And my dog, it depends on the day. It's very interesting. Sometimes she's like, yeah, oh, that's the one I wanna go for. So we want to really use their meal times to challenge their brains a little bit. It's gonna help get a little bit of energy out. And I, you know, I teach this to my training clients as well. So, you know, private pet owners, you shouldn't be just giving them two bowls of food for free. Like make them do something to earn it, whether it is solving a puzzle or doing a training session. Stop just giving them their food for free. So we do primarily five types of feeding enrichment. We feed out of puzzle toys. We feed out of boxes. We feed out of paper bags. And then we have a couple different frozen bowl types that we use. So one, the kibble is just frozen into the bowl. So this is uh, dry and canned mixed together with a little bit of water and put in a bowl and frozen. This is like a margarine tub with the food and water and kibble stuck together. And if you see, they kind of have like a little sprinkle topping of like tiny milk bones. <laughs> Candle staff sort of use 
whatever treats are around to kind of sweeten the deal for some of these. The paper bags, we just put the regular wet and dry food mix right into the paper bag. Same thing with the box. Um, and with the puzzle toys, we'll just use dry kibble because the regular sort of slush that we feed everybody else doesn't work very well to come out of the holes of the puzzle toys. All right, so here, get ready to hear some barking. Here's a puzzle toy. <laughs> yeah. Good boy. <laughs> and that was his first time with that particular puzzle toy. The way to get started with puzzle toys, look for donations so a lot of toy companies will do have shelter donation programs um, we have had some so that particular choice from pet safe we have had some donations from pet safe or put them on your donation list uh, people love to give things like post a post buy one post a video on facebook of a dog doing it and ask for donations for more and that can really engage people and then we don't the way that our feeding enrichment works is we do sort of targeted feeding enrichment. So it's not that every single dog, every single day gets this type of feeding enrichment. It's that this dog is a little bit more active, today is going to get this type of feeding enrichment. So we don't have the staff time to do every single dog every single day, but we make sure that the ones in particular who are struggling with stress, who are struggling with getting all their energy out, are getting these enrichments every day. <laughs> So that was a hanging bowl. That was the one that was in the margarine tub. And we just put, um, you sort of sink a, like a choke chain into it. And that's like the best use for a choke chain, in my opinion. I actually also use a choke chain to hold the gate shut at my house. That's the other way I use a choke chain. Uh, but it's great. And then you just hang it with the carabiner clip to the kennel wall. And they get to kind of bite at it. And some kennels I've seen, we don't have the ability to do this. But some I've seen able to hang even from like the middle of, so they kind of, they're not even bracing it against anything. It's sort of like, um, oh, there's like that donut game that you play at Halloween, right? You hang the donut from the ceiling. It's kind of that idea. Yeah. You see there's a ton of kibble. She has hypoallergenic kibble, so it's that white stuff. There's kibble on the floor. And she's like, I would rather get the kibble that's inside the box. So she's still working, even though there's free kibble like all over the floor. And you know, so we'll use those types of boxes or cereal boxes or even like microwave meals, like put a bin in the staff kitchen area to collect everybody's recyclables so that you can use them for enrichment uh, before you actually recycle them. Um, and you know, is this an, an, is this a strategy I would pick for a really shy dog who's nervous with novel objects? No, no, they're not going to want to stick their head in the box like that. And it's funny when you start to do this, you'll get to see the different strategies. Like some dogs will just stick their head right in the box. Some of them will start chewing on the corner and rip everything up. Some of them will just rip everything up before they even eat anything at all. Like that's more fun than even eating the kibble. He's like, it's a trick bowl. So that was the frozen in the bowl kibble. Uh, and then again, that's like a mix of canned and dry food and then a little bit of water frozen in a bowl. 
Uh, they do a really good job measuring everything out. And um, they actually write like little made on dates on all of the frozen stuff. It's very cool. They're like, 7.30 is like on the edge of the bowl on dry erase markers so that they know how recently the bowls were made and they know if it's time to throw that bowl away. So I think feeding out, feeding out of bags is my personal favorite because I think like watching them carry them around is really cute when they do that. But they just it's easier to rip into than a box, so it's a good one to start with. Plus, you can either look for donations through a grocery store of paper bags. You can ask people. What we do is we ask people to save their uh, like takeout bags, so their lunch bags that they just you know went to. I think that was a Panera bag, uh, and so we get a lot of staff donations of paper takeout bags. But if, even if you're buying paper bags, they're very, very cheap. And um, you can even put out a plea for people to collect their paper grocery bags for you to bring in. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, what about the worry of them eating the bag? Great question. So the question is, what about the worry of them eating the bag or eating the box? Uh, number one, I mean, watch the dog. The first, I always, you're always observing to make sure that they're engaging and eating the food already. So you can see if they're eating a lot of it, then maybe pick a different enrichment strategy for them. Um, but they also pass it really easily. So if they eat a little bit of cardboard, it comes out in their poop. And if they're eating, if she ate that like entire box, like that might be a problem, but probably it's still just gonna come out. Um, our vets in general approve, our, our shelter vets approve of these methods. So whatever new enrichment strategy we want to try, I always have to run it through the medical staff to make sure they approve. We've never had an issue with paper leading to an obstruction or anything like that. Um, and I used to use these strategies at Tompkins County too, and we never had an issue there either. The, I have seen some suggestions for in kennel enrichment of like tying a Kong up in a sheet or like feeding them in more of like a cloth package. And our vets did not approve that because that could be much more likely to lead to an obstruction than a paper product that's going to pass a little bit easier. So the other option for feeding enrichment is really to use them for use the mealtime for training. And you know, it can be clicker training. It, you know, clicker training is great. Like I said, it can be very mentally stimulating. Um, or it can just be to reinforce impulse control and to reinforce sitting for bouncy dogs. So it can just be as easy as taking the dog on leash to another room with a bowl of food and maybe luring them to sit. So putting the food right on their nose, bringing it up over their head as soon as their butt hits the ground, the food comes out of your hand. You do that maybe five times and then you just wait. And most dogs are gonna say, hmm, when my butt hits the ground, that's when I get the food. And then they're gonna sit for you. And reinforcing sit and teaching them an automatic sit through this method can be really nice when you're showing them to adopters because then the adopters are going to say sit or whatever, but the dog's going to know, oh, if I put my butt on the ground, it's a good thing. So you're not even teaching them the word. You're just teaching them that that is a really great behavior to do, an uncued behavior. You're teaching them an automatic behavior. So that can be a really great thing to do. Or you can take it to the next level and add the clicker in there. Um, teach them some other tricks that might make them more likely to get adopted. Um, and for shy or fearful dogs, clicker training is great too. I often work on targeting skills. So like we talked about with the cats, teaching them to touch their nose to your hand, clicking and re reinforcing them for that, or simply just hand feeding them. So I know today um, all the behavior staff is at this, for Lollipop is at this conference. And so the kennel staff are hand feeding the dogs who are in the behavior modification program that normally we would use in our meal times for training. Today, they are just hand feeding them. So it might be in the kennel or if they have time, they might take them to a separate room and just reinforce sitting with them. Uh, for the shy guys, 
it can just be hand feeding. It can just be associating the person with the good things coming. Um, and this could be in their kennel. It could be in a separate room. But again, it's just building a positive association between hands reaching towards them, new people being around them. It can be a really great thing to do. So here's just an example of a little bit of a quick training session um, that one of the kennel staff did with a dog in the back. So you see how he sat almost before she even said anything because he knows like, oh, these people like it when my butt is on the ground. Like good things happen when my butt is on the ground. And one thing that I'd like to work on in the future is linking in sort of click for calm with feeding time. So if you notice in the feeding enrichment videos, it was super, super loud. In the click for calm videos, it was super, super quiet. So we could start to use our meal times just like a click for calm time. And oh, if you are barking, well, you don't get to eat right now. If you are not barking, you get to eat. So it would take a little bit more time and coordination. And I don't know that they have the time to do that yet, but that's one area for expansion for our team. So if you look on the treat column of the enrichment board here, uh, every day they get a different treat enrichment or taste enrichment so that they get to taste different things and smell different things and have different chewing experiences. Um, we typically have, we have toys in everybody's kennel so they might have Nyla bones um, in their kennel or, or hard rubber toys in their kennel but then each day they're going to get something different. So popsicles, paper towel rolls, we'll talk about those in a second. There might be a large milk bone, uh, you know, one of the big giant ones dipped in a little bit of peanut butter. That might be their treat for the day. It could be purple toys. So those are the pet safe toys like this, the squirrel dude, or they call it the Mickey Mouse toy. It's a couple balls put together. Um, it could be a Kong. So we do Kong stuffed with wet food or kibble and then frozen. Or it could be a peanut butter Nyla bone. And this was something we first saw at the um, Rochester Animal Services, the Verona Street uh, Animal Shelter in Rochester. They were giving their dogs Nyla bones dipped in peanut butter. And we were like, what a great idea, because it's hard to wash peanut butter out of a Kong, but it's easy to wash peanut butter off of a Nyla bone. So it's a great way to give them a little bit of taste variety um, without having to clean this like tiny hole of, out of peanut butter. So the frozen stuff that they do looks like this. These are paper towel tubes with a mix of like junky food and junky dry and wet food stuffed in them and then frozen. These are super fun. I say, you know, definitely never throw away a paper towel tube or a toilet paper tube. Like that's either a cat toy or a dog toy. Uh, and then here's some of the variety of like frozen popsicles that they've made. These are I thought these were so cute. I hadn't seen them until yesterday, but these are literally like popsicle molds with little bones sticking out of the top. Uh, and it's just a mix. It's just junky canned food and dry food mixed together and then put into various molds. So these are Frisbees. And I think this one they were trying to make into like a pizza, which like didn't make a ton of sense when you thought about it logistically. But the dogs are having fun. The kennel staff's having fun. And that's what's important. And these really do provide outlets for chewing and shredding. And these are tips we sometimes give adopters or training clients too. If you have a dog who chews and rips and shreds everything and you're tired of them chewing and ripping and shredding everything that you care about, then give them stuff that you don't care about to chew and rip and shred because they're going to start to get out those impulses on productive items like empty cereal boxes, empty paper towel tubes, or you know, a couple milk bones stuffed in a paper towel tube. And then they're going to be less likely to go to the leg of your table. So one of the things we do every day is we spray uh, different scents in the kennels. And on the board, it's the first column here. And here's a couple ones through, throughout, through the years. I found a couple pictures of uh, our scents just to give you guys an idea of some of the ones that we have used. So we've got banana, orange, peppermint, butterscotch, coconut, vanilla. And up here we've got mango, eucalyptus, lavender, lime, orange, lemon, and vanilla. So we get either baking extracts. And actually, Amazon sells some great like sets of them that are pretty cheap, cheaper than if you bought them in the grocery store. We're using one that I think is like juice bar right now. Is that what it is? Uh, and so we've got these, like that's why we have mango and orange and lime. And then we also use essential oils, so the lavender, the eucalyptus. 
not necessarily for the aromatherapy benefit. Like maybe there's a little aromatherapy benefit with the lavender. Lavender, scent of lavender has been shown to be calming, but it's just a different scent for them to smell. And it's really, really enriching. If you only go home and do one activity, I would say try this because it's so fast and you are really going to give them some variety in their day. So we just dilute it with water, put in a standard spray bottle, and then walk through the kennel spraying it. And that dog is nobody's barking. That dog is really barky. That dog like almost never stops barking, that little guy. So once again I'm like ready to take the video and I'm like, well, he's not even like starting to bark, like, you know. But typically if you've got a really barky sweet and you go through and spray a scent, everyone's gonna stop barking at least for a minute or two to smell and everyone will be doing one of these. And you know, it's a lovely moment because you're enriching their world, you're giving them some variety. It's you know something that they might smell in a home and you're letting them do a species typical behavior. So it's a really, really fun, really, really easy thing to do. And that's another one that if, I would actually recommend trying to get a little money in the budget to buy the extracts because if you put it on the wish list, you're gonna get like five cases of vanilla. Like everyone's gonna give you vanilla and then you're not gonna have very much variety. All right, play is really, really important. So we always have toys in the kennel. And again, these are approved. The ones that are approved by our medical team are mostly the hard rubber or hard plastic toys. So sometimes you'll see the big giant plastic balls or you see the Nyla bones or the smaller sort of Kong type toys or chewing type toys for, uh, for the puppies. And studies have shown that having toys in the kennel makes them more attractive to adopters. And even if you don't see them playing with them at that point in time, you want to give them the option to play with them. They might be playing with them when you're not watching or at night. So you want to give them the option to sniff and explore and play with those toys. Outside the kennel, we have different types of toys. So we interact with them with the toys that they can't have in their kennel. So outside the kennel, they get tennis balls, they get tug toys. If you look on the little, the note or the uh, whiteboard for the individual suite like I showed you earlier. If you look on Friday, we look, these guys got to play with stuffies outside their kennels. This guy got a rope, this guy got a stuffy and a rope, uh, and this guy got a stuffy. And so it's just an, another time that's out of their kennel and they're getting to play with a toy with a staff member that they wouldn't get to keep in their kennel. We also have some interactive toys. So this is a little puzzle toy for dogs and we have uh, some of those and you can make a really easy one with a muffin tin and just put treats in some of the wells and then put tennis balls over the entire thing. It's like a little scent puzzle for them to work out. And it's really cute. Some dogs will just like smack it with their paw and everything will go flying. Some dogs are like really, really dainty about like picking up each tennis ball. Uh, this is actually a child's toy. Like I think it's like a beanbag throw. I don't know. Look for them at Goodwill. I got this one for like $4 but you can put peanut butter on some of the sides of the little, these things turn, and then they can lick it and play with it. The feedback I got about that, so this is actually an idea that I got from Leanne Falkingham, which um, she's a great resource for shelter enrichment. She lives in Chicago now, but she used to work at Chemung, and she does a course through the Karen Pryor Academy on shelter enrichment, that's really good. So. This idea is from her and the feedback I got from staff is that it has to be a dog who's not sound sensitive at all because the things make a lot of noise when they turn. So a lot of dogs will get startled playing with that. Uh, and then we also just got these in as a donation. They're like huge balls that you can fill with water or sand. They're hard plastic. And then the dogs can like tug with themselves using that as a weight. Uh, we will also sometimes play with a, fir a flirt pole with some dogs. Um, so that's like a giant cat toy for a dog. The one thing you want to be careful about that is getting overexcited. So you want to be sure to have some good treats so you can trade the dog for the toy once they catch the toy at the end of the flirt pole. But we really want to tailor that to whatever the dog likes. So this is one of our dogs playing with a ball outside her kennel. So we also do yard time. Uh, we have baby pools for the summer. Um, 
And the our enrichment yard also has like a little play, like a little child's playhouse in it and some dog houses for different options for climbing on, for perching. This is part of a really cool homemade agility equipment course that they have at Chemung that is, John, it's like around your walking area, right? Like there's little stations like as you walk around. It's really cool and um, it's all made from homemade stuff. So if you don't have, you know, the fancy tunnels, you can still create things for them to explore and to hop around on. And we don't have a digging pit yet, but I'm really advocating for getting a digging pit. We have to get clearance from the farm manager for that, and we haven't convinced her yet that it's a good idea. All right, another place that uh, I definitely want to expand into is nose work. So right now, um, we are not doing this very much. We teach a nose work class for dogs who are already in homes, but nose work is really great. I just want to make you guys aware of it for building confidence or for increasing focus. So for the really jumpy, crazy guys, it really gets them to calm down and focus. And for the really shy guys, it gets them to approach new objects with more confidence and to be around people that they were previously scared of. So it's really easy to start. Um, you just start with several boxes. We use um, just regular cardboard boxes of various sizes. One box is the food box. They have really smelly food in there, so you can use tuna, you can use salmon jerky, you can use uh, natural balance. And you let them eat a little bit out of the box, and then one person restrains the dog while the other person goes and hides the box. You kind of play the shell game. You sort of are like, oh, is it there? Is it there? Move all the boxes around, and then release the dog to go find the food. And if you're starting with smelly enough food, they're pretty successful right away, so you can start to increase the difficulty from there. Have them search in a bigger area, have them walk into the room and start the search right away versus watching you hide the food. So this is a video of one of my nose work students from a class. So she is a little tiny dachshund who was adopted from Lollipop Farm. And she um, came from a house with, I think like 17 other dachshunds, like very under-socialized. And she, came, she went home and really bonded with her person, Nancy. And so Nancy brought her to my shy dog training class, Bravery Boost, and she started to think, okay, maybe I wasn't such a bad person. And she spent the first two classes just growling and looking very scared at everyone. And then she brought her to nose work class, and I think nose work almost helped her more than Bravery Boost class did. She became so confident, and she would pr approach the other people and some of the other dogs in the class. And you can see she's just really happy. And her person would say that was like the happiest she was all week was playing nose work. <laughs> so she's graduated to finding things in objects versus boxes. Hi, Emma. <laughs> I see her little hop over that thing like she never would have done that before. Uh, and you know she's engaging her brain. She is doing a behavior that comes naturally to her, hunting, searching for food. And she's having a ball doing it. Yeah, her person would always say, Nancy would always say, oh, her tail wags here more than it does at home. And again, these are objects that would have really spooked her, you know, six weeks prior. She's almost found it, don't worry. That's a little nerve wracking. Good girl. Yay. <laughs> Good job, Emma. And if you look, it's she's almost like disappointed that she found it. <laughs> Sometimes with really smart dogs, <laughs> they you see them like find it, they'll their body language will tell you that they've smelled it and they're like, going to keep running around a little bit. This is fun. All right. So we do um, dog playgroups. Uh, we are really safe about our playgroups. So in my mind, it is not worth the risk of doing a huge playgroup with more dogs than people because of the potential risk for fights and injuries to dogs and people. Be besides the fact that if you have a group of dog, adult dogs bigger than maybe four dogs that if they don't know each other that well, somebody's not having a good time. 
dogs tend to play in pairs, and when you have a huge group of dogs, there's always dogs along the edges who are kind of stressed, kind of rather not be there. When you make good matches and you have playgroups that play in pairs or maybe up to four, then it's going to be a lot more manageable situation. And if they're having an off day, you're going to spot that a lot faster, and you're going to be able to separate them a lot sooner and maybe take them for a walk together instead. So we, working with private training clients gives you a little bit different perspective on what's useful for, for people after adoption. And one of the things that is really hard for people after adoption is if their dog just goes crazy every time they see another dog, whether they're excited or scared or angry. Um, and if they could practice walking together, that can be even more useful for the future adopter than if they've had a ton of playtime experience. Because then the dog might be super, super overexcited to see every other dog because they're like, it's playtime. Versus like, oh, sometimes it's playtime. Sometimes we just walk together. So if you have a pair of dogs who are just kind of neutral around each other, they're maybe not actively playing, you can go ahead and assign them to walk together so that they get some companion time, but they're not necessarily jumping and wrestling and chasing each other. Um, so again, we, we really, when we're making our playgroups, we try to make really good matches. We, do, we have a lot of safety, um, safety things in place, which I can talk about more at the end if you guys have questions. Um, and it's really, playgroups are not for every dog, and that's okay. Not every dog needs to play in a playgroup. They are not going to have a void in their heart or their soul if they are not necessarily happy to be in a playgroup with a bunch of other dogs. That is okay. So another part of their exercise are daily walks, and this is usually with the animal care staff or with volunteers. And we really try to coach the volunteers to let them sniff. So this is, we're not trying to hurry them around the block so that they get like a quarter of a mile longer walk. We're really trying to, if they want to sit here and sniff this bush for two minutes, you're going to let them sniff that bush. And they're going to walk 10 steps, and they're going to sniff this tree for another 45 seconds. And that's fine. That is more mentally enriching and mentally stimulating for them than getting a little bit further on their walk. So we really try to coach people, let them sniff, um, and... You know, for us, we try to have the long walks be at times of the day when the dogs don't have to urgently go to the bathroom. So if we're trying to get everybody out to go to the bathroom, the walk's going to be a little bit shorter. At other times of the day, we're going to do longer enrichment type walks. And quiet time with humans. Um, this is really, really important. So most of the time in a home, if you think about your own dog, like what is your dog doing right now? Probably they're just like chilling out. <laughs> you know, they're just probably asleep. Um, and a lot of the time after you get home, you're maybe going to get excited, maybe go for a walk, maybe you're going to do a little training, but then just mostly you're just going to be chilling out together. And so keeping up with that while they're in the shelter can be really helpful for a transition to a home. Just teaching them that just because there's humans around doesn't mean that it's happy, jumpy, crazy time. Sometimes it's just relaxing time. And that's where you can really do office fosters as well. So when you're starting an enrichment program, uh, or you're trying to enhance your existing program, things to remember are just communication. So whether you are a manager and you're trying to engage your frontline staff, or your frontline front staff and you're trying to engage your manager, really try to get good at talking with one another and figuring out what's going to work for you. Um, and just cooperate with one another. So there are some things that anybody can do. Maybe the manager can take an office foster, and maybe frontline staff can do click for calm or sense, just something easy and small to start out with. It's not going to take a ton of time for them. Because it really takes the entire shelter. And when you can work together with people and really make everyone feel like they're part of the process and feel empowered to do these things and engage, the animals will benefit and the people will be happier too. Uh, and if you saw in all the videos that like how excited the kennel staff members were to give the feeding enrichment. I mean, it's really fun. And you know, they came up with those boards on their own. That wasn't something that came from a manager. So really, our end goal is to place happy puppies into good homes. And hopefully, that's your goal, too. Thank you to staff and volunteers at Lollipop Farm um, and to the blog My Dog Likes. Thank you. Thank you.